Okay, good evening. Welcome. Today has been a fun day for me. Um, I have got to go around the different locations of Rehope. So this is this is the final one, uh, the evening service here in the West End. And I've got to say, I know you're not allowed to have favorites, but I'll say no more. It's been a pretty great Sunday for me. I've really enjoyed it. It's been a privilege to go and see uh, like big picture Rehope and what God is doing in our church and in our city through our church. It's been really fun. It's been awesome. I've loved it. I don't know if you caught it, but uh, last week was a pretty special Sunday, and not just because Alan was here teaching us uh, on the Bible, but it was actually the second of the second 2020, which meant that it was the first palindrome day in 909 years. Apparently the next one I think is coming in over 100 years, so if you're really optimistic you might see another one, but it's quite unlikely. Um, last Sunday was also Super Bowl Sunday, which means absolutely nothing to me whatsoever. It was also Groundhog Day, which did mean nothing to me whatsoever, but then my lovely American friend Caitlin educated me and told me that Groundhog Day uh, is a day when a groundhog called Phil makes a weather forecast. So Phil, um, who's on the screen, he's the animal, not the man in the hat. He came out of a burrow at 7.25 a.m. last Sunday, somewhere in America, and apparently, because he did not notice his own shadow, we are going to have an early spring. Now, I don't really know how you um, assess whether a groundhog is perceiving its own shadow, but apparently there is a way. Um, so he didn't see his own shadow. We're going to have an early spring. I think that's good news. I don't know whether that is pseudoscience, science, superstition, or just something that America made up. But I'm going to take it because his name's Phil, so he sounds trustworthy. <laughs> I think it's good news because January, uh, I don't know about you, but January was 40 years long for me. And it is only February, however, so I don't want to get too far ahead of myself. And as such, I have been assessing, uh, you know, a couple of months into 2020, how I've been doing so far in my New Year's resolutions because I've been tracking um, a certain amount of self-sabotage. I decided going into this year that I was going to read more books. Um, I thought I would set myself quite a achievable goal, thought maybe like one, two books a month, you know, max. I like to set the bar nice and low so that I can definitely climb over it. So I thought maybe one or two books a month. And um, that was all very well and good until uh, season three of This Is Us became available on Amazon Prime. And then Netflix released Cheer, that documentary about cheerleaders, which apparently I can't finish a book, but I can inhale a series about competitive human pyramid making in about three days. Um, so that was my week last week. I also have been reflecting about how I had decided going into this year that I was going to cut down on my screen time before bed, but now I just sleep with a Kindle and a phone under my pillow, so really I've just doubled my screen time uh, before bed. I shouldn't be surprised, and I'm not super surprised at my ability to self-sabotage, because when it comes to the great drama of my life, I am the queen of self-sabotage, um, a habit that I've developed over previous fasting weeks. So we do a fasting week in January, five days of prayer and fasting, something that I have just started to compulsively do is to watch videos of cakes being iced on my Instagram feed during like Wednesday, you know, like day three, just like watching glaze dropping over cakes, going through those little panels. It's all very artistic, it's all very lovely, but it's awful, it's really not very helpful when you're trying not to eat. I've also um, gone for a spray tan and willingly permitted medium to dark uh, before, another type of self-sabotage. In a habit forged by years of deliberately trying to defy my mother, I quite often go out without a coat on in Glasgow, uh, choosing to dress for the weather I want to see in the world rather than the weather I actually see out my window. And last year, um, in what was potentially an all-time low, I consumed three full advent calendars before December 1st. <laughs> So my flatmate was going away for a few weeks, and um, she's a nice person, so she had bought us both a, a, an advent calendar. I did tell her this, I think. Yes, yes, I did. You're fine. It's not like confession time. Um, I bought, she bought me a calendar. She bought herself a calendar. I bought her a calendar because great minds feel, think alike and all of that. And then uh, she went away for like three weeks, and I ate them all. I ate mine, and then I ate hers, and then I ate her second one, and then I replaced both of hers, but I didn't replace mine because I had lost the right to such a privilege by that point. We can all self-sabotage at times, and ourselves be the thing that stands in the way between where we are and where we want to be or where we are and what we want, we're quite good at it. And I think that it's good to pause in week four of our reawakening series as we think about obedience. We're going to think about obedience tonight because as Brian said in, in the video in the first message of this series that, that launched us into thinking about reawakening, 
he talked about how obedience is one of the pillars, historically and biblically, of any time of reawakening, where people become uh, awake to God, more awake to God and who he is, and more alive in Jesus. There's always uh, an element of obedience. There's always an element of turning back to God and, and in obedience, and bold, radical obedience. And as I've thought about it this week, I've been wondering about how, like, as a church and as people that make up this church, we run the risk of potentially uh, like praying for reawakening, longing for reawakening. We could read our Bible from cover to cover. We could meditate on it day and night. We could be desperate for it. But if we don't live lives of bold obedience, we could stand in the way of God's presence, of his moving, of his uh, reawakening power in our time. By refusing to live lives of radical obedience, we could self-sabotage. We could ourselves be the block when it comes to the awakening of our own hearts and when it comes to the awakening of, of the hearts of other people around us who were desperate to know Jesus. So I guess that my question for us all today is, could we be more awake to God and alive in Jesus on the other side of radical obedience? Am I awake to God and am I feeling alive in Jesus or is there a step of obedience that I need to take? Now, talking about obedience, um, it can be a little bit of a buzzword for people, it, and it really matters that we uh, know that we have a good starting point when it comes to, like, who we are being obedient to, who God is, what, what is this authority that we're going to be submitting ourselves to, because we've been trained to associate obedience with punishment or with the avoidance of punishment. I don't know about you, but I was conditioned to be safe in the car with threats along the lines of, you know, put your seatbelt on or the policeman will get you, as if, you know, there's a prison full of six-year-olds somewhere who were just too slow to put their belt on or you know I saw more than one parent over the Christmas season you know fake dial the phone to Santa Claus in front of their screaming toddler we've been trained to associate obedience with avoiding punishment but our starting point tonight as we think about this and as we go through this reawakening series needs to be that God's authority is not just a bigger like more blown up version of the human authority that we know already he's not the angry man at customs who makes you feel like you must be smuggling farm animals and he's not the police car that passes you in the street and makes you do that panicked like phone speed belt check he's not the teacher who's like a slowly ticking time bomb or a mass punisher taking away our golden time he's not some big boss behind a divine surveillance camera and he's not that man that presenter of fort Boyard, the 1990s TV show, who's just like endlessly setting us unachievable tasks and the, the clock's ticking. Our starting point today is that just as we remembered a moment ago, God is the God who loves us and wants us to love him back with all that we are. He loved us first before we could ever be obedient to him when we were far from being obedient to him when we were far from walking in his ways romans tells us god demonstrates his own love for us in this while we were still sinners jesus died for us it's essential that we plant that right at the foundation of anything when we're thinking about obedience here is that we didn't need to love him first we didn't need to be obedient first but he loved us first and he made a way jesus died to show us that as first john teaches that god is love and there's no fear in this love 1 John 4, 18 says there's no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. God loves us and invites us to love him back with all that we are. And because he's God, that means radical, wholehearted obedience from us. And the message of the whole Bible, if you read it through, is quite consistent that to love God with all that we are is to obey him. And every week we repeat those words, we repeat together, Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. And where that little part of the Bible appears in Deuteronomy, it comes as a culmination of a fairly long passage where Moses is addressing the Israelite people, God's chosen nation in the Old Testament, and he's um, commanding obedience, and he's forbidding the worship of other gods, and then he introduces the law through the Ten Commandments. And after all of this, chapter 6 reads, these are the commands, decrees, and laws the Lord your God directed me to teach you to observe. Hear, Israel, and be careful to obey so that it may go well with you, and that you may increase greatly in a land flowing with milk and honey, just as the Lord, the God of your ancestors, promised you, which then leads into, Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. And after that, these commandments I give you today are to be on your hearts. 
our love for God and our obedience to God are all wrapped up in each other. They're one and the same. To love him is to obey him. To obey him is to love him. And the context for God's people here is that they have just been, they've been rescued by God. They've cried out in their distress. They've needed him. He's, he's acted because he's good, because he's gracious. He's rescued them. He's brought them out of slavery. And they're on the edge of going into the promised land, of inheriting all that he has for them. And all of this talk of obedience and not worshiping other gods, it's not framed in such a way in Deuteronomy as to be like, so that you can avoid being punished. It's so that they can unlock everything that God has for them. Moses says to the people, be careful to obey, not so that you may avoid punishment, but so that you may live and take possession of the land God is giving you. If we want, if we really do want to be people who are awake to God and alive in Jesus, if we want to take full possession of what is available to us through Jesus, then there is a call for us to live lives of bold obedience to him. Or we could end up forever people on the edge of it, maybe longing for it, praying for it, saying, God, your kingdom come, but never actually seeing the breakthrough that we long for or not seeing the fullness of what God can do in our time and through us and in us and in this city because we ourselves are, are, are blocking it. This starts, it starts with us. It starts with us taking it personally. Something we've been coming to terms with as we've, as we've started this new series is that reawakening, when we think about people coming awake to who God is, it, ha it has to start with us. We can't... Um, push reawakening on other people if we've not been woken up to who he really is and if we've not come fully alive to Jesus. It was part of our Bible read through this week so I was in Deuteronomy and I'd sort of like camped out in chapters four to six for quite a while and I was struck by how in the lead up to chapter six where, where the bit we just looked at Moses takes the people on a journey of remembering first and I think wholehearted obedience for us will always come out will always flow out of our knowledge, a right knowledge of who God is and what he's done. It'll come out of our remembering of who he is. Now, the Israelites have seen and heard God in massive ways. They've been rescued by him. They've seen him do miracles. They've heard his voice very clearly. And Moses says to them, even still, be careful and watch yourselves closely so that you do not forget the things your eyes have seen or let them fade from your heart. Don't let them fade from your heart. I don't think things, I don't think knowledge of God tends to like fade into our heart. But we forget and things can fade from our heart. And even for these people who had seen such miracles and wonders, there was a risk that if they weren't careful, if they didn't watch themselves closely to remember that things were gonna fade from their heart for them. And this is why, like we read the same scripture. We go through the same scripture basically every Sunday. We, we tell the same story. We remember the same story together. We make time for share time every week because we want to remember what God is doing. We want to remember that he's moving, that he's living, that he's active among us. It's why meeting with other Christians in small communities, in bigger communities is essential because we need to be careful about remembering. It's not something that we do naturally. It's something that we need to watch closely. And what we need to remember is that God is God and there is no other. Um, there's a wee bit that Moses says to the people, acknowledge and take to heart this day that the Lord is God in heaven above and on the earth below. There is no other. I love that sentence. There is no other. Take it to heart. It's so clear. To live lives of bold obedience, I think we need to take it to heart that there is no other. We have to burn the boats and the backup plans. We have to be prepared to be in the minority. There are going to be many other stories around us about what can rescue us, about what is worthy of our love. But ultimately, there are other stories around us which are crumbling. One of the stories we maybe hear is that um, our happiness or our individual freedom can somehow rescue us. And yet we see at that breaking down all around us. We see it breaking down publicly when you've got crises and things like Hollywood, business, politics, even the church, when human brokenness is just exposed as it is and there's no answer to it. We see it breaking down privately when we've got like an anxiety epidemic, mass loneliness, confusion about identity, who we are, what are we for? We see people everywhere and maybe you know yourself, like I know we can feel like sickened by the broken promises of the world. We can feel sickened by the false gods, the things that seem to give us hope but then don't really, or the things that seem to provide answers but then don't really. 
and that's the context we're in. And in the midst of that, we have, a, we have an opportunity to pursue obedience to God like there is no other, to say that we're willing to build our lives on that. What can obedience unlock for us? If we think about obedience as something that's not um, to avoid something bad, but is actually gonna like unearth some treasure for us, what can it unlock for us? I've got three examples from the Bible. Uh, which I think just hone in on on different things that obedience can maybe unlock for us as we think about reawakening. So the first one is uh, the Israelites, back to the Israelites again. So as they prepare to enter the promised land, as the law is introduced by Moses on many occasions, they are told to hear what God has to say to them. The Hebrew word for for hear there being um, Shabbat, which means to hear and to respond accordingly. It means to hear and obey, basically. They're they're commanded to truly listen. Now I am... I talk to my mom on the phone a fair bit because I live away from home. I'm from Northern Ireland. And there are times when I'll talk to my mom on the phone and I could say something like, Mom, I just fell flat on my face. And she'll say, oh, very nice. Very good. It's like, okay, you're a little hard of hearing. I'll say, my mom, my, mom, my life is in crisis. She's like, very nice. Very good. I sometimes wonder, does God experience a similar frustration when we let his words wash all over us when we hear him, but we don't really shema hear him, when we don't respond accordingly to what he has to say to us. Everything the Israelite people are commanded to do is anchored in this repeated command to truly listen to God, because listening to him is going to be the roadmap out of sin and away from sin and into more of his presence. In fact, he's leading them by his presence into a place where his presence is going to dwell with them. Deuteronomy 11, 12, 11 says, you'll cross the Jordan and settle in the land the Lord your God is giving you as an inheritance, the place the Lord your God will choose as a dwelling for his name. I really like how hearing God and obeying God are held together here because it reminds me that obedience to God is not uh, some sort of like legalistic endeavor, but it's deeply personal. If I obey him, if I hear him, then I'm walking in step with his voice, whereas if I disobey him, I'm ignoring him. On one hand, sin in my life, sin in our lives will cut us off from his presence, but whether that's uh, sin that we're embracing, sin that we're like willfully pursuing, or whether it's just sin that we're like permitting to be in our lives, on the other hand, obedience will unlock more of his presence for me. Because I can't pursue God in one area, but also ignore him in another and expect to find him there. I know that because there are times in my life when I've tried, I've had times in my life where I felt like I'm desperately chasing down God's presence, where I'm desperate to see him move, where I'm desperate to hear him speak, where I want to see him answer my prayers in the way that I want to see them answered. And all the while, he's not been far off, but he's been speaking and convicting me and speaking to me about sin in my life or speaking to me about something I needed to root out or something I needed to stop or something I needed to start. And he was never far, but all I actually had to do was turn around and acknowledge him actually hear him and obey him. Now, because of Jesus, the incredible news and the almost unbelievable news is that not only does he lead us into more of his presence as we walk with him, but we have become, the New Testament teaches us that we are now living temples of God's presence, so he will come and make his home with us, in us. He will come and dwell in me. I don't need to chase down his presence. It's my inheritance. It's my right as a Jesus follower to have his presence with me. But if I'm content to live with sin in me, then I'm pushing him away. It's like having a keep cup that you've forgotten in your car for three weeks and the milk at the bottom is gross and like there's like just a little residue of like disgusting fetid tea in there. Like you wouldn't bring it in and make a fresh cup and pour it straight into the cup there's dirt, if there's grime, if there's sin that I'm content to live with in my life, then I'm, I'm pushing away the goodness and the fullness of who God is in me if I'm a living temple for his presence. And as a church, as the church, we are now mysteriously and incredibly a living temple that's made out of living stones, each of us being one of those. And if you think, okay, on, on a personal scale, if I'm a living temple for his presence, and then if I am boldly obedient and he fills me and I'm filled with his presence, if you imagine like on a bigger scale what that could be like if we all were uncompromising, if we all lived boldly obedient lives and he came and, and dwelt fully in each of us and then that was what the church was like, would we make space for him to move truly, powerfully? 
Next example is Joseph. Now, just a little portion of Joseph's life because there's a lot going on, but catching up with him in about chapter 36 of Genesis, he has been sold into slavery. He's got an Egyptian master. Um, the story, As the story goes, he um, prospers. God's with him and causes him to prosper, and his master sees that he's successful, that he's good in what he's doing, and so he promotes him. Great news. And then the story zooms in on this one particular tricky altercation between uh, his master's wife and Joseph, where she makes rather a blunt proposal that he spends the night with her, at which point Joseph says, my master has withheld nothing from me except you because you are his wife. How could I do such a wicked thing and sin against God? And immediately after we read, she spoke to Joseph day after day. He refused to go to bed with her or even to be with her. Day after day, Joseph I don't know, you watch the movie, Joseph, and Potiphar's wife makes kind of one big blunt proposal to him. You don't see the like day after day, him being worn down by like persistent and attractive opportunity to disobey God, but it was day after day. And how does he respond? He responds by refusing. He calls it as it is. He says that would be to sin against God. He calls it out. And then he removes himself. He says he refuses even to be with her. I think there are things that may crop up in your life, that may crop up in my life, that maybe have cropped up, where the right and obedient response is to refuse and then to remove yourself. I feel like sometimes God's loudest declaration to us is just to stop compromising. Maybe there's an area where you just need to give a bold no and step back to stay on track following him. Now, for Joseph, this this clear, bold no, this refusal lands him in prison, but it unlocks what we can see in retrospect is this incredible God plan and purpose in his life, which I think hinges on this act of simple but bold obedience for him. Now, his life is a roller coaster of highs and very real lows, but all throughout his story, uh, there's a repeated mention of people seeing that God is with him, and then he's invited into like these new areas of leadership and influence. He's put in a very specific prison, the one where the king's prisoners are confined. He's put in charge of the people in prison. He's given relative freedom in his captivity if things are put under his care. The presence of God with Joseph because of his obedience unlocks Joseph's purpose. And he's strategically positioned to fulfill this incredible God-given destiny that has nation-changing impact. But would he have known in that moment with Potiphar's wife or in those moments would he have known the potential impact of his obedience? I don't, I don't think he would have because he doesn't have dramatic irony on his side in that moment in his life. He can't look back as we do and think, oh, Joseph is so obviously on track. This is incredible. Look at how God's helping him and moving through him and mightily using him. He would have just had that thing in front of him that he had to refuse, call a sin, and then remove himself from. He couldn't have known the incredible impact it was going to have on his life. If there's an area in your life now where maybe you're tempted to compromise or maybe there's going to be something in the future where it might not be dramatic and it might not be like huge, it might be just ever so slightly off piste, but you might be just aware in your heart of hearts that it's not exactly what God would have for you. Maybe it's a relationship, maybe it's someone you're tempted to date, maybe it's a habit that God has said stop it. Maybe it's something that God has told you to begin that you've just not quite yet, or something that he's told you to do that you've just not quite got around to yet. We see in Joseph that full obedience unlocks God's plans and purposes, and simple acts of obedience, simple moments in our life can set us on track for his plan, for what he wants to do in us and through us. A good few years ago, um, I came to a point in my life where I was just like totally mentally, emotionally wrecked, exhausted. And in that, as can often be the case, I didn't, I didn't react well to it. And things were hard, and I found myself in a place, and I found myself in, in relationships and in situations where I just knew, like, I'm off track. I'm not, this is not where God would have me. It's not what God would have me do. And I need to somehow get back on track. Because I was following Jesus at the time. He loved me. I loved him. None of that changed. But I was just living in a way and I was, I was in a space where I just knew like in my soul that something was wrong. And in God's grace and in his goodness to me at that time, I had the opportunity to, um, to move very far away for a year. And I really felt like 
that's where the Spirit of God was leading me at that point, and that's what obedience would look like. And I didn't really want to do it. But by his grace, a few bold no's, and then the ability or the the leading of him to go and to be far away for a while was what I needed. And I, I look back on that moment in my life and I think, I don't know what hinged on that. Like, I don't, I don't know. It feels so much like it was like a T-junction and, and either way I could have gone, it just would have been very different. I wonder if there are times maybe you've had in life where you've had to make a, a similar turn and you've had to decide, okay, do I continue? Like, I am on this track and I know it's, I know it's not the one God has for me, but do I continue? Or do I swerve? Do you hear his voice? Do you hear his call towards something else? For Joseph in this moment, it's, it's a simple moment and there's pain as a result. He goes to prison. But in prison, he, it's like incubation for him. Like he learns what God is going to do in him and through him. He, he interprets dreams that seemingly it goes nowhere. But then on the outside, when he, he comes to interpret the king's dream, you see that all add up and you see what God is doing through him and in him, even while he was in prison, teaching him to say, I cannot do it, but God will give Pharaoh the answer he desires. People note that the spirit of God's in Joseph in a time when the spirit of God wasn't in people. Living with bold obedience, we're filled with God's presence. We're propelled towards our purpose and it doesn't mean that if we're a little bit off track that there's not grace for that or that God can't still move in our life or that he might not still be speaking or leading or helping us because he very possibly is and will. But there's something about the fullness of obedience, being able to lo- unlock the fullness of what God has for us. Maybe it's like the difference between the Israelites on the edge of the promised land going in, but maybe not taking possession of what God's given them or us being saved, us coming to a saving knowledge of Jesus and having eternal life, having the promise of that, it's secure, but not really taking hold of the life that he has for us right now. I think for the sake of reawakening, if we really do long to see people come awake to God and alive in Jesus, then we need to not settle for just what will do or what is fine. But we need to hunger after more. We need to hunger after fullness of what God has for us. Final example, maybe a sense of where to begin. So I I reread Jonah this week, Um, his story. My little Sunday school brain just went straight to Jonah when I was thinking about obedience because in my memory, it's a sort of moral fable about making the right choice and making the wrong choice. And yet, as I read it again this week, I was struck by how like it's so much more a story about a man running away from God. (laughs) It starts and God speaks and then Jonah flees says, but Jonah ran away from the Lord and headed for Tarshish. He went down to Joppa, where he found a ship bound for that port. After paying a fare, he went aboard and sailed for Tarshish to flee from the Lord. He makes a real effort to get away. He pays money. He gets on a boat. And yet, because of who God is, God goes after him and he gets a second chance. And I love how uh, the book of Jonah is formed in kind of chapter one and two, because you have two really clear commands from God. You have two moments when God really clearly speaks to Jonah and then in the middle of them you have this incredible prayer from the belly of a fish. And as I looked at it again this week, it seemed so much less a story about a man in the belly of a fish and much more a story about this man who is conflicted and torn and fearful and then comes to know God as his helper and turns around. His prayer reads, in my distress I called to the Lord and he answered me. I've been banished from your sight, yet I will look again towards your holy temple. When my life was ebbing away, I remembered you, Lord, and my prayer rose to you. He remembers God and he takes to heart who God is. He says, salvation comes from the Lord. He acknowledges who God is and then God speaks again. And this time, it's simply, but I think quite significantly different. Because in the first time God speaks, he says, um, preach against Nineveh go and preach against Nineveh. The second time he speaks, it says, um, the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time, go to the great city of Nineveh and proclaim to it the message I give you. This time it's not preach against Nineveh, it's go to Nineveh and proclaim to it the message I give you. It's almost as if God is like, take one step. Here's your first step of obedience, Jonah. Just go. And then I'll give you more. Then you can proclaim to it the message I will give you. And so Jonah obeys this time. He obeyed the word of the Lord. He went to Nineveh. Then what happens? Now Nineveh was a very large city. 
the text tells us it took three days to go through it. Jonah began by going a day's journey into the city, proclaiming, 40 more days and Nineveh will be overthrown. The Ninevites believed God. A fast was proclaimed and all of them, from the greatest to the least, put on sackcloth. The Bible doesn't tend to do unnecessary detail and I like that it mentions that he, bega he begins by going into this city that is so big it would take three days to get through. He goes in one day. He turned around and he began. He takes one step of obedience. He begins, he starts, and he speaks what God tells him to say. And there is incredible reawakening impact, ripples of reawakening from the least to the greatest until the king issues a decree saying, let everyone call urgently on God. Let them give up their evil ways and their violence. Who knows, God may yet relent and with compassion turn from his fierce anger so we will not perish. God's word through one little guy who didn't even want to do it the first time and a whole city who are so far from him is changed, convicted, changed. They come awake to who God is. And we see that obedience even of one person, how much more even a small group, can unlock incredible reawakening impact. So as we um, prepare to finish tonight, I guess I hope that the Holy Spirit among us can nudge us whether maybe there's, there's some of us tonight and we just need to learn to truly listen. Like maybe God has been speaking and God has been um, speaking to you about something and the words have just been washing over you. Maybe he said something in the past that you've never acted accordingly in response to. Maybe we just need to learn to listen to him. Maybe there's something in your life where you just, you need to refuse to compromise. Maybe there's an area where you need to refuse and then remove yourself from completely. Maybe that's what obedience looks like for that. Maybe you just need to turn around, take a step in the right direction, stop running from God and move towards him, take a step to just begin. A first step of obedience today may be the biggest turnaround moment of your life. It may be to simply give your life to Jesus for the first time. It's got to be the start or to recommit your life to him if you've been off track for a while now and you want to go back if you want to turn around because for all of us this road of, of walking of living life in bold obedience to God it has to come within a relationship to Jesus it has to come in discipleship to him because otherwise we can't we can't learn how to do it we can't be formed into his likeness apart from him we need to live life with him we need to follow him because he's going to teach us how to do it he's going to help us to do it and for the rest of us, I wonder if today, as we look ahead, as we continue to go through this reawakening series, we could commit to really hearing God, if we could commit to living lives of such bold obedience as if his presence is worth it, as if we want it enough, as if uh, we're hungry for it enough in this place that it's worth the obedience, that it's worth being radical about it, that we might see more of his presence here that we might unlock more of our purpose and our potential and what he wants to do in us and through us and that ultimately we might see more people come awake to who God is and come alive in Jesus a few challenges for us tonight the first one uh, most of these are actually kind of self-reflection challenges so I would encourage you if you can carve out some time this week uh, spend a bit of time with Jesus ask these questions pray listen journal, write things down, um, but maybe you can start tonight, maybe even in the response time as the, as the band come back and uh, we do a last worship set, maybe you can even begin uh, to think about these, especially number one, so just that prayer to ask, okay God, are there any obedience issues in my life? Is there a way I can take a step of obedience right now? Is there something I need to do right now? Second challenge is um, I would recommend listening to Brian's Reawakening podcast, episodes four and five. They are super practical about 20 minutes long a piece and he just leads uh, you through like five questions to pray and to ask God okay uh, is there an obedience issue here what about this what about this what about this and they're really practical really helpful and like I said 20 minutes long so not a huge amount of time this week if you wanted to do that assess where you're at in response to those and then finally if there's anything that comes up if there's anything that comes to mind if there's anything that's highlighted for you a chance to deal with it a chance to recommit or a chance to commit for the first time to living a life of bold obedience in a hope to see people, to see yourself come awake to God and alive in Jesus. Those are the challenges.